You should watch this at night. Hey Curious Cats, my name is Sahara, welcome to the True Crime channel, let's get into it. Tonight is the highly requested Devin Erickson case. We are in Highlands Ranch, Colorado, south of Denver, May 7th, 2019. Devin Erickson, age 18, and Alec McKinney, age 16, go to school that day, seems like a pretty normal day. Each one of them are carrying guitar cases, but they don't contain a guitar. There's guns inside. The morning of the event, Devil is in school. He says he's feeling unwell. He goes to the bathroom. He throws up. Then he goes to the nurse's office. He sends a message on Snapchat to Alec. He's asking him to get out of class. Alec doesn't respond immediately, so Devin sends another message saying, I am not doing this alone. Alec replies, we have this all planned out. And Devin responds, go now. Then Devin gets to his British literature class. He's a bit late because he was at the nurse's office. The students are watching the movie Princess Bride. So he gets inside, he closes the door behind himself, he gets to the back of the room, he pulls a gun and he says, nobody move. In an attempt to save his classmates, one student, Kendrick Castillo, immediately rushes towards him, which gives the opportunity for other students to either hide under their desks or escape the classroom. Kendrick is shot in the chest and then two other kids joshua and brandon they lunge at devon and they neutralize him joshua will be shot in the leg and hip and brandon will be unharmed alec is in another part of the school it's not clear where he was exactly but he will end up injuring eight other students while police is on the way a tweet is sent warning people to avoid the area Ambulances and police arrive, as well as buses to help evacuate students and staff. Inside the school, there's a message repeating, we are on lockdown and all the lights are out. I'm pretty sure we don't really have this lockdown procedure in, in France or, or probably even in Europe, but I'm assuming the lights are out so the shooter or shooters uh, can see people and can't shoot them. 911 calls are made by students, by staff. Um, some students send messages to their parents. And there was this one message from a girl to her mother. And she says, I love you. And then she doesn't respond for a bit. Then her mother says, what's going on? Please tell me everything is okay. Otherwise, I'm going to freak out. School shootings are so common in, in the US. So I totally understand that she reacted that way. I think any parent would have. And the girl who sent this message to to her mother, she then leaves the classroom. She sees a sort of trail of blood on the floor and she notices two police officers holding down a student, Devin Erickson, her former boyfriend. At first, when police arrive at the school, they have a hard time getting inside. I'm guessing it's because of the lockdown because I think every door was locked, locked down, makes sense. We don't do that in France, so yeah, I was just not sure. And once they're in, they're not even sure who the shooter is. At that point, they don't even know there's two shooters. There is a description given to them saying he has pink hair, then purple hair, then he has a Nirvana hoodie. It's all chaotic and, and everybody's confused. This school has security guards and one of them was armed and he accidentally shot two students. He was actually firing at a police officer, but in the chaos of the situation, he saw someone with a gun. He thought it was the shooter, so he just fired. He didn't hit the police officer, he just fired in that direction and two bullets hit two different students. The security guards are the ones who are able to neutralize Alec and Devon is arrested by police officers. The security guard in question was actually not supposed to carry a firearm, especially not on school grounds, but he was not prosecuted because it was decided that, first of all, he participated in neutralizing one of the shooters, so he definitely saved some lives. And it was also determined that his actions were in compliance with applicable law. Deadly physical force may be used only if a person reasonably believes a lesser degree of force is inadequate and the actor has reasonable ground to believe and does believe that he or another person is in imminent danger of being killed 
or of receiving great bodily injury. The shooting will last for about 20 minutes. Everybody who was injured was actually a student. They were all sent to hospital. Two of them were in critical condition, but they will survive. The suspects were not injured. Sadly, Kendrick Castillo, the first student who tried to neutralize Devin, died from the bullet he received in his chest. Kendrick is described by friends and family members as a smart and loving person. Uh, he was passionate about technology. He had won awards for the school robotics team. He wanted to work in aerospace for NASA. He was gonna graduate three days after the tragedy. He seemed to have been very close to his family. His father spoke very fondly of him, saying he was a good kid, raised with great values. Because of what he did, others are alive. And I thank God for that. I love him. And he's a hero. He always will be. It's no surprise that if danger was facing him, he would approach it, you know, and take it on. If it was something like that, he was extraordinary. Nothing can beat love. Nothing. You know, if you spend your time with your kids and you teach them that, you know, you'll have done your job well. That's all I want people to know. His mother said she's still waiting for him to come home. I mean, everybody in this family was as you can imagine, devastated. You took something from me that can never be replaced, said his father. I will never find peace. Kendrick Castillo absolutely loved his Jeeps. His friends telling me that he detailed his Jeep so often that it was easily the most well-kept vehicle here at school. It was that love for his Jeep that Coloradans heard about, and they wanted to make sure he was taken to his funeral in a way that he would love. They teach you in school that you're supposed to run away. And... Um, he did the exact opposite. Kendrick's a hero. Many never knew him, but the stories of his heroic actions will stay with them forever. Kendrick's closest friends say Jeeps were his everything. Wednesday, behind a police motorcade, Kendrick's casket was escorted to his funeral by hundreds of Jeeps, including his own. Kendrick's father said Alex's tears were crocodile tears. This killer is a monster. No one will know my pain unless you're me. No one can ever take away that pain. It's eternal. He specifies that he does not believe that diminished mental capacity took place, as he said himself, meaning that he just doesn't believe that because someone has mental health issues, they should be forgiven for killing someone. On God, do I agree with that? He said that it was a well-orchestrated crime and both shooters are monsters which they are. On May 15th, just a few days after the tragedy, about 2,000 people gathered in the school gymnasium to honor the memory of Kendrick, the fallen hero. At some point during this gathering, there was a police officer who started speaking about gun control and many people left saying, we're here to pay respects to Kendrick. I mean, he saved lives and it was just not the time and place to talk about politics. We are pretty much really mad because they turned us into politics about gun control. When we came here to respect our brother Kendrick, we came to respect him. <laughs> what is happening at STEM is awful, but it's not a statistic. You can't be used for a reason for gun control. We are people, not a statement. Not only did Kendrick lose his life, and like Kendrick was so young, he was an extraordinary human being. Everybody had nothing but amazing things to say about him, but also everybody who survived and everybody who was indirectly affected by this, parents and neighbors, everybody's traumatized. Many of them suffer from PTSD. I mean, look at this picture. This kid was being evacuated and he was in tears. I mean, it wasn't just teenagers at that school, it was kids as well, because the STEM school has a primary school, a secondary school, I think it's called, and high school. Many of the people involved in this tragedy will later say that any loud noise that resembled shooting, fireworks, nail guns, glass breaking, uh, it just scares them and it takes them back to that day. It's not just noises, it's also certain smells. The worst thing is that in March this year, so last month, there was another shooting also in Colorado. 10 victims, including a police officer. The whole thing was live streamed on Facebook because yeah, that's what people do now. And so to everybody involved in the STEM shooting, you can imagine how it opened up a very fresh wound. And I say open up, but I mean, it's not over yet. I'll get into that later. Kendrick's dad spoke about this other shooting and he said to the victim, to the family of the victims, uh, the loss is only the beginning when the perpetrator survives. Like meaning that the court proceedings are gonna take forever and the family are gonna have to relive. Their trauma is just gonna be a nightmare. Who 
are the shooters. We're going to start with Devin. Devin Erickson was born in 2001 in Colorado. He lives with his parents, his sister. He has no criminal record. According to his social media content, he seems like a pretty normal teenager. He likes hamburgers, skateboarding, paintball. He hates Christians because of the homophobia, or so he says. He hates Trump. He loves Obama. He posts about stuff like his Halloween costume, his dream to become an actor. He was on two local theater productions and he started enjoying it. He even sent his resume to The Walking Dead because he wanted to be part of season five. He also likes to play the guitar. The clip you saw at the beginning of this video was him singing. He was the lead singer and guitarist for a rock band. One disturbing thing that I found, maybe in retrospect, is one of his Facebook likes. It was a page about AK-47s. Devin seems to have a good relationship with his mother. On a Facebook post once he wrote, Happy Mother's Day to the best mother in the world. You have always been there for me, even when I struggle to do things and when I can't seem to get things right. I know I suck at math. You always help and are super understanding. I love you, mom. When he was arrested, Devin had the word God written on his chest. I don't think it was a tattoo. I think he just wrote it before the shooting. When his house was searched, they found writings on the wall of his parents' closet saying, the voices win. His mother's car was towed for analysis and bomb search. I don't know why bomb search, but yeah, they searched for a bomb. On the side of the car, there was spray paint, a pentagram 666 and the words F society. If you're familiar with the TV series Mr. Robot, you know what it means. If not, it means F society. Well, it doesn't really mean F society. I mean, I guess it does, but it came from Fun Society, which is a, a theme park in the in the series. I mean, it makes sense when you watch it and you should because it's really good. And just FYI, this show does not promote violence or murder. It's not violent at all. It's about a group of hackers led by Mr. Robot. Their goal is to take down world corporate structure. Just think of them as the anonymous fighting capitalism, I guess, to a certain degree. One thing that I found interesting about this show is the main character, Elliot, is a drug user. He suffers from anxiety, depression, delusions, hallucinations, and paranoia. I don't know, I just think it was an interesting choice. Regarding the events, when Devin is interrogated, he says to police that Alec is behind it all. He's the one who came up with the idea and Devin just followed. Devin said he received a Snapchat message from Alec on that day telling him to not come to school, which doesn't make sense for two reasons. One, Devin is the one who provided the guns. What happened was on the day of the shooting, when it was their lunch break, I think, they went to uh, Devin's house. Alec and Devin went to Devin's house and they took an ax. They broke into the safe, their parent, um, Devin's parents' safe, and they took the guns. And the second reason is he was also part of the planning. They agreed on how everything was going to go down. They even decided that they should go through the middle school entrance because they would be able to bring in the guns. Devin says that in the original plan, he was tasked with just guarding the exits and asking people to not move. It's not what happened. It's just what Devin says anyway. And this is probably an attempt to minimize the role he played in the shooting and he probably was trying to make Kendrick's death seem accidental. He also reported giving up his gun pretty easily when Brendan and Joshua lunged at him to neutralize him, which is not what happened. Brendan and Joshua claimed that he was actually aiming his gun at people's heads and he tried to fight back. Had it not been for uh, Kendrick taking a bullet to save his classmates, giving the opportunity for both of them to neutralize Devin, he probably would have killed more people, even though he says he never meant to kill anyone. Showing up to school with loaded guns and you did not plan to kill anyone? Okay. Devin also claims that he only shot once, which is not true. The investigation will reveal that he fired many times. He said he regretted his actions immediately. He gave up easily since it wasn't even his idea. He was pushed into it. He even claims that Alec forced him to do it and he threatened to kill him with an axe if he refused to participate. Devin also revealed that before the shooting, when they were at his house, they both drank vodka and they had cocaine, which is pretty uncommon. Usually in school shootings, the perpetrator or perpetrators, they want to be focused and they want to be sober. They want to have a clear head. It's not known for sure if Devin was a drug user before that one time on the day of the shooting. And there's also no known diagnosis for 
a mental health issue. But his defense team decided to go that way. And I think they assumed, or maybe they knew, that he was suffering from something. Maybe he was undiagnosed, or maybe it's something that is just not revealed to the press, to the public. Devin did mention to some friends that he was having mental health issues. And friends do report him as having a dark sense of humor, as being very edgy and provocative. And because of that, because of everything they knew about his personality, some of his friends were actually not even shocked that he was one of the shooters. Devin also told friends that his life at home was very difficult. It could have come from the fact that he was adopted. I'm actually not even sure about that 100% because I only found it in one article, so I'm not 100% sure that he was adopted. There are just no details about what kind of difficulties he was going through. Alex's story is very different. He was born female as Maya McKinney in April 2003. He lives in Castle Rock, about 30 minutes south of Highlands Ranch, where the school is located. His parents, uh, Jose and Morgan, they meet, well, I don't exactly know when or how. Um, they have Alec in 2003, then in 2007 they have a son, and in 2008 they have another daughter. And even though Jose is very violent with Morgan, she accepts his proposal and they get married in 2009. Shortly after that, Jose is arrested for attempted kidnapping and threatening Morgan with a weapon. He is sent to jail and he requests himself to stay in police custody since he has a drug and alcohol problem. While he is in jail, Morgan files for full custody of their three children and it will be granted. Jose spends 15 months in jail before being deported to Mexico in 2010 because he is an illegal immigrant. Morgan then files for divorce in 2014 and a year later it will also be granted. Somehow Jose finds his way back to the US and he's deported again. In total, he will be deported back to Mexico three times. Throughout his life, Alec will have mental health issues and drug use problems. It's probably linked to the absence of his father and to being witness of the domestic violence and also being bullied at school for being transgender. Some family members deny the addiction problem, but a lot of his friends know about it. They know Alec uses cocaine, he smokes marijuana, he also uses prescription drugs like Xanax and also non-prescription drugs. It got so bad that some of them were actually planning an intervention. I don't think Devin was among those friends who wanted to help. Alec's mother, Morgan, she is aware of the drug abuse and that was the reason she refused that Alec start taking testosterone as part of his transitioning to male. I don't think that Alec was officially diagnosed with a mental health disorder, or if he was, it's not known to the public, it was not released to the press. He also said to police officers and also in court that he was hearing voices. He said the drugs helped sort of manage that, but friends noticed that it actually made things worse, hence the desire for the intervention. He did report to friends that the voices were getting worse, he was having hallucination, and he even had sometimes some thoughts that were not his own. One article does mention the fact that Alec had a treatment for the voices he was hearing. He was feeling better, but at some point he stopped taking his medication so the voices would come back and he would not be alone. He was institutionalized a few times for his mental disorder and the self-harm, he started cutting himself at some point from ankles to shoulders, a friend would say. Alec will also say that the voices would tell him to cut himself deeper because he deserved to suffer. He was not a good person. He was a bad person like his dad and he deserved to die. And it was so bad that the cut sometimes would need stitches, but Alec always refused to go to the hospital, mainly because he didn't want his mother to know about it. Well, she eventually found out, so... Alex also revealed to investigators when he was interrogated that he was suicidal since the age of 12. And in fact, part of his plan was to commit suicide after the shooting. He was seen on CCTV footage from the school pointing the gun to his head. Later, he will explain that his suicidal thoughts slowly became homicidal. Or at least it began with him wanting to hurt others like they were hurting him. A friend of Alec reported to police that there was an incident involving drugs. Alec gave Xanax to a friend. I mean, is she really a friend if you give her Xanax? That girl actually had an overdose, but she survived. When he spoke about this incident to his friend, he said he nearly killed someone. Alec was then placed in a juvenile diversion program, which is a program meant for kids to actually be kept away from the justice system. And while he was on this program, Alec was having therapy sessions and also treatment for the drug addiction. But he told his boyfriend that he found a way 
to cheat the drug tests. Since he was transgender, the officer who was male could not go inside the room where he would provide his urine sample, so he would just swap it with a clean sample. I'm guessing it was provided by some other teenager who was at the same center. Funnily enough, Alec and Devon only met a few months before the attack. They just met, they bonded, and they became friends. Alec said they would do drugs together, which is not something Devon confirmed. It was Alec who came up with the idea of the shooting. They started planning it, which only took a few weeks, and then they put their plan into action. The weird thing is that Devon was seen by some friends as being capable of doing that. Like when they found out who the shooters were. Some people were actually not surprised that Devin was one of them. They did not expect Alec to be the other shooter though, let alone the mastermind. They knew about the mutilation, they knew about the suicidal thoughts, but they never expected him to harm others. When I did my research, that's not how I felt at all. Alec was suicidal, he had obvious mental health issues, he had been institutionalized, I mean everything was there. The father being absent, being transgender, which can also be very difficult in the sense that he was bullied about it. He obviously felt bad, he obviously had deep emotional issues. And Devin, from the outside, I think it looked like his family life was perfect, he loved his mother, he seemed to have a great bond with her. I mean yes, you don't know what happens behind closed doors, but why is it that we know about Alex's chaotic family life or life, and why is it that we don't know anything about Devin's life? Wouldn't he have used that at trial? I don't know. It's just weird. Unexpected. The trial of Alec McKinney began in February 2020. He pleaded guilty in the hope of being freed on parole. The counts include first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, possession of a weapon on school grounds, possession of a handgun by a juvenile. And this is just to quote a few among the 17 counts. Now, of course, the big question is why? Why did this happen? Alec will explain both during the trial and police interrogations that his motive was not his absent father or the domestic violence he witnessed at home. It was revenge. Some kids in school were bullying him and not referring to him as male, and some even went as far as saying they were disgusted that he was transgender and he and they hated him. During the trial, Alec will say, I wanted everyone in that school to suffer and realize that the world is a bad place. He said he wanted them to suffer from trauma like he'd had to in his life. He added that STEM school was his worst experience and he was constantly surrounded by negative people who talked about killing themselves all the time. Alec admitted to manipulating Devon because it was so easy. He said he was just an idiot who jumped on the bandwagon easily. Don't you love their friendship? Alec apologized to the Castillo family, Kendrick's family. He said he regretted his actions. He also apologized to the students of the school and everybody else who was affected by the events. He encouraged kids who felt the same way to seek help. If someone is planning a school shooting, just ask for help, he said. I will never repeat these actions ever again because the harm I caused is truly too much to bear for anyone. I don't deserve leniency nor forgiveness. I don't want a lighter sentence. Alex's family was present in court. His mother testified and said she did not understand why the shooting happened. She also apologized to the Castillo family, but when she started and said, I want to say how deeply sorry I am for your loss, at that point the Castillo family just left the courtroom. They did not want to hear what she had to say. She begged the judge for mercy and she asked the court to take Alex young age into consideration. It's no excuse, I know, she said, but I hope there is some leniency. Then she spoke to her son and she said, you can still right your wrongs, I love you always. In July of the same year, July 2020, Alec McKinney is sentenced to life in prison plus 38 years without the possibility of parole for 20 years. It's not going to bring Kendrick back, so I don't know if that's enough. Now, because Alec is transgender, the issue of where to incarcerate him was brought up and it was decided that he would be in the male wing of the juvenile corrections facility, but he has his own cell. All right, this next part is, I don't know, a bit confusing. Under the hashtag free Alec McKinney, there are dozens of tweets asking for his release. Okay, but to be fair, a lot of tweets are actually asking what's wrong with people wanting to free a killer. Being trans is not a free pass for, for killing someone. Yep, that is a good question. The trial of Devin Erickson was supposed to start on September 2020. 
then it was delayed to February 2021, and then again it was delayed to the 24th of May 2021. And the reason it keeps being delayed is because the defense is asking for an evaluation of Devin's mental health, and apparently they want to be thorough. Devin pleaded not guilty, stating again that Alex was behind it all, and he also told police that Alex had one person in particular that he needed to confront. And by confront, I think he meant kill. And get this, Devin even claimed that he tried to save as many lives as possible. He's the one who pulled the trigger and actually murdered someone, so... I don't think he's got the right definition of saving as many lives as possible. Just saying. Devin faces life in prison without the possibility of parole. And I hope that's what he gets. Regarding the STEM school shooting, there were a couple of disturbing events that happened prior to the shooting. The first one being a Wikipedia entry, not an entry, but a comment that was made on a, an article. We don't know who made that comment. And it was nine days before the shooting. The comment was found after this section of the article, I guess. Anti-suicide programs are implemented to help lower chances of suicide and school shootings. And the comment was, do they work? We shall see. It's pretty creepy. Police is still trying to identify the author of this comment. Five months before the shooting, a parent sent an anonymous letter to the director of the school saying they were worried about student violence and drugs and sexual assault that had been reported. And in that letter, they mentioned Columbine. You're probably familiar with the Columbine school shooting that happened in 1999. And uh, the city it happened in, Littleton, is actually only a couple hours away from Highlands Ranch. That worried parent ended the letter saying that the environment at that school was the perfect storm. If you're from the US, I guess you probably know that Columbine is not the first school shooting. Its media coverage was definitely unprecedented, but it's not the first school shooting. I looked into it because I was curious, and it turns out that the first school shooting happened in the 19th century. So the big question is, why so many shootings after Columbine used Columbine as a sort of blueprint. I read in a study that half of the school shootings that happened after 1999, after Columbine, they were inspired by Columbine, or at least the perpetrators were obsessed with Columbine. So it's a pretty scary thought. A lot of experts are trying to find an answer to, to the question of, of why it's becoming more and more popular. I'm not going to get into it right now because I haven't researched it yet because I want to save this for when I do Columbine. I'm probably going to cover that in a future video. So I want to end this video with something a friend said about Kendrick. Kendrick died for us, so we have to live for him. The governor of Colorado said, rest in peace, Kendrick. Your bravery won't be forgotten. And just FYI, May 7th was declared by the governor as Kendrick Castillo Day across the state. He also renamed part of the Colorado State Highway 470 as the Kendrick Castillo Memorial Highway. And this concludes the STEM school shooting case. Thank you very much for staying with me till the end. As usual, if you have any suggestions, please leave them in the description box. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet, and I will see you soon. Bye.